Good afternoon. Today we are reading from Death Watch by Rob White. We are on chapter six. This is Miss Clark Reads to You. And we left off where Ben uh, was underneath an outcrop um, on a summit of a small mountain. And he had decided that he would nap and then travel in the evening to um, get to the catch basin so that he could get water. At first, Ben didn't know what had waked him, but he awoke with dread, as though some enemy was close on him, threatening him. His wounded cheek had swollen so badly that his left eye was completely closed, and he could not even with his fingers open it enough to see out of it. It was still daylight, the sun seeming to be squatting on the western mountains, no longer moving down but staying there, pouring its heat on him. Then he heard the sound and realized that what what it was that had waked him up, a tinkling sound of metal on rock. Pushing himself up a little, his head toward the sound and turned far enough to see, with his right eye he looked down. Ben could only see Madoc's head and shoulders and could not tell what he was doing. Pushing himself on, on up, pain throbbing into his legs, he looked around the outcrop. He could see Madoc clearly now. The big magnum was propped not far from him against the cliff, cliff face, and Madoc, his fancy bush jacket dark with sweat, was using the jeep's short-handed shovel. It was insulting, infuriating, and Belt then it felt a strange, weak, childish thing. Don't do that. He silently begged, don't do that. Madoc had shoveled most of the sand out of the catch basin and was sloshing out the rest. The sand filled water looking dull and gray in the sunlight as it flew from the shovel and splashed down on the bare slopping hot stone, sloping hot stone. The water ran down the stone in a little shallow stream, vanishing as it ran. So one interesting fact that I would record here is that uh, Madoc removes water, and I'm going to call it H2O, from catch basin. And he does it in a way so that it will uh, evaporate, so that Ben can't get to any water. There's nothing left. He doesn't shovel sand into it. He shovels the water out of the catch basin. Holding the rock with his hands to keep the weight off his feet, Ben moved back behind the outcrop and slowly let himself down again. Now all his hope for miracles was gone and Ben was left with a strange and chilling thought. He and this man Madoc were locked together, chained together in a struggle for life itself. A struggle with no niceties, no rules of behavior, no sportsmanship, and no gentlemanly conduct. Madoc could not leave him. The struggle had gone too far for that. Nor, on the other hand, could Ben escape. Without water, he could not make it across the miles of open desert. And even if he had water, his feet could not endure that distance. In 10 miles, the flesh of his feet would be worn away down to the bones. So one of the, um, the, the symbols that is going to play itself out in this, uh, in this novel is this symbol of the chain. Madoc and Ben are chained together. They're locked by this conflict, by this competition. Madoc, the Jeep was the key. The Jeep was the key to life. The Jeep was the key to life. Notice how Ben's is not water, not food, but the Jeep. The man with the Jeep would live. The other man would die. 
There were water protection, food, mo food movement, communications, weapons, and comfort with the Jeep. So the Jeep had all those things. With the Jeep, one man could kill the other, and Maydick had the Jeep. Ben sat, sat watching Maydick walking back to the Jeep, the gun over one shoulder, the shovel swinging on his hand. He looked so satisfied with himself, so jaunty in that cocked up Australian hat. You know, Ben had been close to death a few times. On highways, on high crag, on a high crag once in the helicopter when the rotor clipped a treetop. The closeness could be measured in inches or seconds and death had gone past him before he actually recognized how close it had been. At those times, the fear came after death had gone and he could, in safety, think back to what might have happened. Now it was different. Death was close and he knew that, but now he had time. He could sit here and think about it could feel it coming slowly, minute by minute, and hour by hour. In his mouth and throat, he could feel death as a strange, unwettable dryness, which his saliva could not diminish. He could feel it in the swelling of his tongue, which had started back in his throat and seemed about to choke him with its dry mass. Twenty more hours? Question mark. Or was it only nineteen now? Another question mark. The sun had finally started moving down behind those huge mountains to the west, like a hand stretched out to help him. A long, thin, and almost rectangular shadow came steadily across the desert toward him. Ben followed the movement of the shadow with his eyes. That's a beautiful simile, that this shadow comes out to him like a hand to help him. 300 mil million years ago, the place where he now sat had been submerged beneath an inland sea, and the plateau at the foot of the mountains had been a great marsh covered, covered with weird and enormous mosses and ferns. Then the first animals with backbones had appeared, strange fish, and later there were reptiles in the swamps. At this time, the great eruptions, the immense flowings of lava, the extrusion of mountains from the almost fluid surface of the earth had quieted and the climate became cold. All the northern world lay under thousands of feet of solid ice. Now, we're getting like a, 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 a lesson on the history of the formation of the world here and the reason why Ben is giving us this lesson in his mind is because he is looking at the desert. He is looking at the outcroppings of stone. And Ben is, a, is studying to be a geologist. Geo means rock. So Ben knows about the outcroppings of rock in this desert and how they were formed. And so he's going through this in his mind because, he, because he's com contemplating Something is calling him. One of these rocks is calling to him. 200 million years ago, dinosaurs had walked where the Jeep now sat. And six million years later, Tyrannosaurus lizards that stood 20 feet high and had fearsome claws and teeth roamed what was then almost all marshland, lying under a cool and rainy climate. And then about 60 million years ago, the earth here had become violent again. The whole chain of the Rocky Mountains it was vomited upward and volcanoes erupted and built themselves up and died and were eroded away by wind and water. At this time, the climate was mild and pleasant and the first horses had appeared, hardly as big as basset hounds with toes rather than hooves. At some point during all the violence of prehistory, there had been a volcano about seven miles from where Ben sat. Rock, melted by the intense heat of the Earth's deep interior, had been pushed upward by unimaginable pressures and had broken through the cool crust of the Earth at this place. The molten rock called magma had been forced upward with great violence, filling the sky with a fountain of stone so hot it flowed like water. And like water, the stone had fallen back around the hole in the Earth, slowly forming a cone of cooling rock building up layer by layer into the conical shape of a volcano, into the conical shape of a volcano. 
Even as this mountain of once molten rock was forming, magma continued to be pushed upward, not only through the hole in the earth, but on up through the hole in the conical mountain. Gradually then, as the pressure beneath the earth diminished, a solid core of rock filled the hole in the mountain. This rock, because it cooled more slowly than the lava expo exposed on all sides to the outside climate, formed a harder, more dense stone basalt. And the volcano died. The winds loaded with fine particles of sand and pumice from the volcanoes began to erode its conical sides and rain ran down the slopes, washing them slowly away. And cold, which froze the water, caught in stone cracks, split and splintered the surface, and a sea rose and lapped on the top of the basalt core. I just want to make an observation here as an English teacher, how beautiful this last section of the sentence is split and splintered the surface and the and a sea rose and lapped at the top of the basalt core split and splintered the surface and a sea that alliteration just gives this uh, formation of rock a poetic sound until at last there was nothing left of the high conical lava mountain except the core, the plug of the volcano. It towered straight up from the floor of the desert, steep-sided, erect, slender, a monument to those ancient times of violence, a tombstone. And its shadow beckoned him, its shape haunted his mind. So, the, uh, the shadow of the butte haunted him. Mm. from the sun setting behind the mountains. Mm. Rob White, Rob White has a beautiful way of making nature have life come alive. This is called personification. Ben estimated the butte to be 400 feet tall and half a mile in circumference. So circumference, half a mile. 400 feet tall. Woo, that's a big butte. In some places, enormous, almost flat surface slabs have been broken away and lay scattered on the desert below, making a rubble of stone called breccia around the base. So this is all breccia around the base that has, you know, fallen off over time. It's called breccia. That's an E. Those are C's. Breccia. It's around the base of the butte. The breaking away of these thin slabs left flat edges like giant steps up the sides of the butte. So they are like, I'm gonna erase the word haunted him just so that I can have my stairs here. This breccia forms almost stairs because of the way these slabs have fallen. And uh, hold on. And other erosive elements, such as the cold, as, as the cold of the glacial period, had split the surface stone, leaving long perpendicular cracks in the sides. So perpendicular, per perpendicular cracks in the sides of this uh, butte. Okay, he's analyzing this butte. He's not just looking at it because it's beautiful. He's thinking about it being part of his survival. The top of the butte had been worn flat. So this is flat. There was little on that monument of stone to interest an animal, no vegetation for the bighorn, and no carcasses for the coyotes, no reason for a cougar to lurk there. Vultures might use it for a roost. Snakes would investigate the cracks for lizards and rats. But that stony pinnacle would be home for few. Okay, so we're gonna stop there at that stony pinnacle uh, where he's analyzed that butte. And uh, if you want to write an interesting fact, Ben is analyzing the butte's features. That's what I would write there. I look forward to reading the rest of chapter six with you. We left off on page 73. 
Have a good day.